Mm-hmm. Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and welcome to the Eddie Network podcast. My guest today is my friend Kenneth Mickelson. I think I got that right. Mm-hmm. You did. My Danish friend who is a writer and in particular a a huge influence upon me for having identified um, that I was a person like many others who is a neo-generalist. And Kenneth and his writing partner, Richard Martin, uh, co-wrote this book called The Neo-Generalist and uh, has part of my story in it. So Kenneth, it is really great to have you here. I look forward to our conversation um, and I'm I'm grateful for your work and your your impact upon my life. And so, welcome. Tell us tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and how you came to be the, the person you are today. Yeah. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It and uh, it's lovely to see you there in your your library as well. I didn't uh, uh, mention that before. I. Um, It's true, we got to meet through the book. Um, I reached out to you because I had a sense, you know, a lot of this is also intuition um, and we might get to talk about that as well. Yeah. Um, This whole thing of, you know, sensing that there's someone out there in the world that might, uh, you know, not not someone who has lived the, the, the same life as you have, but had sort of arrived at the same point where they're trying to, make use of all their life experiences in the best possible way and not wanting to be narrowed down by a singular title or, uh, you know, uh, or just, just being in one singular knowledge domain. So that was the, that was how the, the book idea came about in the, in the first place, because, um, and there's a, there's a very sweet story behind that because I actually met Richard through Twitter in the first place and and i got a sense for his writing and i really enjoyed reading his stuff because it was it was very thoughtful it was kind of different uh you know he was using uh, cycling as a metaphor for leadership to describe uh, all the things that goes on, on on a cycling team and and i thought that's interesting that's a different way to talk about leadership that i can relate to that i find uh, invigorating in a way um because, you know, let's face it, when we're talking about leadership, it's also about poking holes in the bubble that most leaders live in and introduce a different language in order to elevate their thinking. And I, and I found that really, really enjoyable. Uh, so we met in Paris during a conference, uh, Enterprise 2.0. It was all about social business and all that. Uh, and then we skipped the conference at one point and we went for a walk. It, we The conference was at a, a particular place in Paris where I lived for three years, very close by. So I knew the area very well. And uh, so we went for a walk at Pierre Lesieux uh, Cemetery. And then it was kind of interesting because, you know, you have all these different people who are buried there, Edith Piaf, uh, Jim Morris, and uh, Chopin. And then, you know, we got to talk about all these people under the, you know, under the ground, so to speak. And then that sort of stirred a conversation about what are you interested in life? Because, you know, you have music, you have philosophy, you have all these different things that sort of came into the conversation naturally. And then, you know, walking is always a good idea if you want to elevate your thinking as well. So, that's that's how we met and I at that point I had been thinking about you know this idea that there are some people out there that are really valuable in society not just in organizations but in society in general people who are noticing things that others don't people who are speaking up um, people who um, who are generous with their knowledge share it with other people, try to um, to bring different perspectives into, into our lives gen- in general. Uh, and I could see that these sort of, uh, you know, there were all sorts of ideas and I had this feeling that it was probably, the first initial thought was that I researched this for nearly f- four years and I called it knowledge brokers. Uh, 
because that was sort of a term that was known at that point. So I was really investigating that a lot. And I have a background as an investigative journalist. So, so you know, I was picking all sorts of stuff from the internet and reading books and trying to get my head around this. And then I said, to, I said that to Richard while we were walking, you know, I, I really want to write a book about these people. What do you think? And then we got to talk about that. And then I called him up when we got home after that conference. And I said, do you want to write the book with me? Um, and then I went to see him in Whitstable in Kent in the UK. Um, and I live in Copenhagen, Denmark. So, and we had a couple of days together. And I think in one and a half day, on the back of the, the research I had already done, I, I sort of sent him some rough sketches around what I thought could be interesting to write about. And then, you know, in the span of two days, we carved out the whole book. And I have collected people that I thought would be interesting to bring into the book at that point. And then, you know, from there, it really, it really sort of, <laughs> it was a very natural process because, uh, the second day, I remember, we had already had the chapter titles up on the wall, and they lasted throughout the whole book, which is quite, you know, unique. Uh, and we wanted it to be not a traditional business book. We wanted to write it in a poetic way. We wanted to bring in different perspectives. We wanted to interview a lot of people to hear their opinions and, you know, learn from their lives. Uh, and it's and it became a very uh, central point in our book that we wanted. To, so there's the middle chapter is called Shoring Fragments, and it's a T.S. Eliot uh, term that he used. Um, and you know, the Shoring Fragments was that was the that was the middle of the book, or well, that is the middle chapter of the book. But at the same time, it was all these different people's stories that we brought together to elevate. Uh, different ideas about how these people um, became who they were or, or who they are, but at the same time also to to illustrate how did they arrive at that point in in, in life, um, and uh, and yes, and then it, of course the the central idea in that was that we, especially in the Western world, have this notion that you are either a specialist or a generalist. And we really didn't believe in that dichotomy because, you know, what does that reduce our human capability to? That you have to be either one thing or the other. And we thought of it as a continuum or an infinite loop where you throughout life can move on this continuum where you have specialism on one end and generalism on the other. And, you know, we all do that. We all do that in life. It's a, it, it's human nature. Uh, and yet through specialization, through education, through the way we, we operate in organizations, we're often being pushed in one category or the other uh, because it's easier to handle. It's, it's the other thing, you know, when you recognize that people are capable of doing both, it's harder to fit people in. And that was some one of the ideas that that sort of emerged, or one of the things we started to realize when we interviewed you guys. That you know, it's hard to fit in when you don't want to be narrowed down to being either or. Yes. And I, yeah. Yes. It, it, and so you you make this point in there of um, generalization, generalism, moving towards specialization. And that rather than the other way around. And, and I thought that was a really um, very insightful way of looking at it, that there there is present with on all of us this sense of, of the general understanding of the world, our embrace of, of the whole world. And we see everything. And then at some point we have to narrow down and, and focus on a few things in order to, to do work or generate income, whatever it may be. Say something about how you came to see that. I, you know, when you start wondering about stuff, it's always because you have a lived experience yourself. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I, there was something that was sort of nagging me 
I, I couldn't really put words to it at that point. It was almost like a feeling of um, being misplaced or um, not not being recognized or that I had to dumb down basically mm. what, what who I was as a human being. Um, and you know, in the book we use this um, um, this term of the chimera. The uh, the mythological an, uh, animal with a um, with a lion's head and a goat's tail and a snake or or a, a goat's body and a and a snake as a tail, and you know I I felt that you know if I had to get into an organization who had to do work, some people would want me to present myself as a snake, other people would want me to present the lion's head, but I should I sh what I shouldn't do was definitely to show the whole animal because that would confuse people. So I think with your coming back to your question there, um, it's often in the eye of the receiver that there is a need for putting a label on people because it makes it easier for us to get a grasp of who you are. So I'm a journalist or I'm a CEO or then we sort of we can narrow down the scope and say, oh, so I, I get it. I get it. So there's a there's a sort of a, a natural negotiation for meaning when we meet people, for instance, the first time, especially if you go to a conference or something like that. You know, if you can present yourself in a simple way, in a in a way that can be easily perceived, um, you can easily get to talk about other, other things, right? Um, and I think it doesn't really do us any justice as human beings because we all have many different ev events from our lives that shape us and, you know, that psychologically form how we approach the world and how we perceive things. And when we are being asked to narrow down who we are, we, uh, we're also excluding a lot of the good stuff. And I see that in organizations where things are organized in silos, but also in the example I often use is the simplistic way of approaching um, some of the uh, big challenges we face in the world today. So all of them are entangled and systemic. And yet we work on uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, for instance, we break them down into specific areas. But the problem there is that it's all entangled. So you can, as a company, choose to say, well, we're working on these three goals. Yeah, but what about all the others? Do they do your effort in one area have, have implications in other areas that you not might not be aware of? Or that we are asking specialists to come up with solutions for um for poverty, for instance, or for reducing poverty or education or whatever, but they don't speak together. And we need people to speak together in order to come up and, and engage in that negotiation for meaning. Yeah, because I think, I think that's a, a major issue um, in for planners, people who are, are, are seeking to, uh, leaders who want to take their business somewhere else and they're, they sit down to do a planning process. And I mean, in my experience as a consultant, we would, I would oftentimes go in to solve a problem and we never ended up solving that problem. We just talked about the problem because that was really the problem was that we just had not talked about the problem. They really weren't interested in solving the problem. They wanted to, to present the appearance of solving the problem. And, um, and so that is how in some ways this specialization has turned out. It's a form of appearance that shows that we are someone to be respected or have authenticity or what, whatever that is. And um, and I think at that point, we take this identity on and whatever that identity is, is the form of marginalizing us. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm really interested in you uh, speaking to us about how does one look at their life <clears throat> and um, in a sense, expand it to be this neo-journalist person where you're able to take all these different things and, and bring them together, meld them together into something that's whole that then becomes the, the kind of the center of your life. How do, how do you, how do you talk with people about that? Um, 
maybe before I go into that, I just I just want to mention that you know, even though the title of the book is the neo journalist and not the neo specialist, um, it's really important to emphasize that you know one thing is not better than the other. We need both. And a neo journalist is someone who is both a specialist and a journalist, and and it's actually from specializing in various domains that you will be able to cross pollinate knowledge from one domain to the other and all those different things. So so it's super important to say it's not an either or, it's really a both and. Uh, so I, I just wanted to point that out, and I I know you know that, but I maybe for the good point. It's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so your question about how do you do yeah. well let me restate it in this way um people have been people's experience has been they've been slotted into a role within a structure but they feel that they're more than that role i mean i've heard people say this to me yes. but they don't know how to break out of that role break out of that mindset of being marginalized into this specific institutional identity how do they how do they break out of that so they can see uh have a better sense of who they are in a more holistic sense that maybe they can venture into new a new path and and find a way to have an impact that you know 10 years ago they would have never imagined oh i, I can't imagine having arrived at this point in my life and how great it is i mean that's that's I think that's the thing that you and I have that we have we share is that that sense of aspiration. But that aspiration really means we have to expand our reach and expand our our sense of who we are, expand the um, the skill sets that we we need to focus at the same time. Yeah. So one of the key things for a neo journalist, I think, is curiosity and a sense of wonder. Um, so, you know, psychologically speaking, of course, it, it's, it's easier to be curious if you had a um, sort of a secure base coming from, from as a child, uh, because it's, it allows you to sort of go out in the world and, and, and come back and, you know, bring back the harvest and say, oh, did you know, I just experienced that. And then you're being in encouraged to even do more of that. So I think it's, it, you know, there are some psychological elements to this, of course. Um, but I think curiosity in the sense that uh, I am a very, very big fan of the, um, of the uh, uh, German writer, Rainer Maria Rilke, mm -hmm. who wrote, I live my life in widening circles. And if you think about that, it's really how we all live. So, you know, you can imagine life being a house. And in order to become a master of that house, there's several rooms you have to visit. And each door is sort of opened through an event in your life. So it opens the door, you enter the room, you don't really know what's there. You're, you're sort of uh, trying to navigate the room and find out the textures and the, the contours of the room. Uh, and, you know, what we meet in that house are always existential themes like death, friendship, love, um, truth. We have to be able to navigate in that house and to become a master of that house. And that's how life is. It's about becoming a master of your own house. And it requires for you to have some sort of curiosity to open more doors to um, discover the full house to 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 really understand what it means to be human, and I'm you know for that reason I'm I'm an existentialist even though I hate putting labels on, but it's what really what I keep coming back to is to investigate what makes us human, and then my interest in leadership comes after that. I'm most foremost or first and foremost I'm interested in what makes us human, and then secondly. Why are you a leader based on 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 all those human qualities and and characteristics? So, so how do you um, how do you define leadership? How do you characterize it? What's what's that look like to you? Um, 
there are so many different <laughs> different uh, definitions. I know, I know it's it's a big question. But but if I have to give a very simple one, I would I would likely call it that leadership is the management of meaning. Mm. So that we as human beings are involved in a constant negotiation for meaning. And that if that house that I just talked about, if you come with one house and another person has a different looking house, you have to find somehow some commonalities in what you've experienced in life and your background and your knowledge and all that. And we engage in those conversations and, and meaning negotiations constantly. And as a leader, if you have a... Um, 20 subordinates of people that you work with, you know, you need to be able to negotiate that meaning as a team. Sometimes you have to go to someone individually. Sometimes you need to do it in, in, in uh, all of you together. Uh, but it's getting a, a feeling for a lay of the land so that we know what is need, what needs to be done here. It's the recognition of different skill sets and characteristics as a human is, and saying, you know, what are you capable of doing? might you try this because i think that you will be great at this and so it's also that gentle hand in the back where you say you know i think you can do this i i got your back so Let's that so that connection that encounter with people is a major part of that and it's it's seeing the future or seeing what's coming applying a sense of meaning to that applying meaning to that person all, all those things kind of come but i, I kind of see this as is the way neo generalists actually function. You know, it's they 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 um, it's it's a collection of things they're taking off the shelf and they're going to make this. It's like creating a, a beautiful salad. You know, it's got all these different things in it, but it's something whole and it's recognized as salad. It's not recognized as tomatoes and carrots and peas and lettuce and and dressing. It's recognized as a salad, and that's and that in a sense is what leadership is. Yeah. And yes, I, I I agree, and it and it's um, and somewhat it's it it touches upon our view of human nature. So uh, if you think that human being, you know, I am I am a I'm someone who really believes in helping people clarify what their view of human nature is, if they want to be leaders, because you know it determines everything else. Um, and uh, and let's say, for instance, you you have a view of human nature that 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 human beings are above nature, for instance, that you know we are the one controlling things. No wonder that you will be uh, engaged in uh, in exploiting the earth resources without taking into account that you're actually just a visitor here. Yeah. Uh, and at the same time, I think, if you think you're done in life, you're done. We are human. We are always in the process of becoming. Um, and, you know, we change throughout life. Mm -hmm. So this whole thing of, you know, th that life is not static. And, you know, that's also what we try to illustrate in our book, that it was this infinite loop, that you're in constant movement yeah. across, across the infinite loop. And what I've realized in recent years is that how significant events are in pushing us in various directions. Um, that um, you know, you meet the love of your life in a in a in the metro, or you know, you have a death in your near family. Life pushes us in certain ways in in different directions, and it's contextual, of course. It it shapes the context for where we are, and you know, put that layer on top of these 20 people working together with a leader, you know, you have to be able to deal with that as well. So there's a certain maturity, I think, that's required when you step up and say, you know, I, I accept becoming a leader. Then you also accept that you need to be able to do work on yourself. You need to be able to really closely investigate what are the components that make me who I am? Where are my blind spots? Um, how's my decision-making process? Uh, what are the things that I'm missing in my perspective? Uh, where where can I 
surround myself with people who might have that perspective so that I don't end up making uh, biased uh, decisions, for instance. Yeah. So really about having that, as you say, holistic view on uh, what it means to be human. And it, and it seems like this is a description of life as one of constant transition. I'm not using the word change, but transition. And I think this is, and I'm guessing this, but in, in your book, you and Richard tell your stories and you talk about yourselves as wanderers. And this idea of wandering, um, I, I want to explain that because I think that might be helpful to people to think of themselves as on a journey, you know, wandering. Um, but wandering is not the same thing, okay, I'm going to go get on a train and I'm going to Paris today, you know, or whatever it may be. So what, uh, flesh this out a little bit about why, how that came about in, uh, the, in the creation of the book. Yeah. So there's a chapter in the book about the two wanderers, which is Richard and I. And, and the reason for us writing it in such a way was that uh, we wanted to illustrate to the readers that there is not one singular way to become a neo journalist that Richard's story is different from mine, but that we, through our various journeys in life, uh, have ended up be becoming very good at certain things, uh, sharing interest in certain things, and having also a like spiritedness, you could say, where we also share certain values. There are certain things that we consider to be important in life. Um, so, my, I mean, my own personal story is, um, is in the book. And, and, and when I grew up, I always, I, always, um, I always had difficulties when people asked me, so what do you, you know, to answer when people ask me, what do you want to become when you grow up? <laughs> because I, there were all sorts of, you know, the, the well was my oyster. I could, I, I, I would do anything. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I've always had this sort of um, inner feeling that my life is lived in, circ in, in circles in, in many ways. Uh, circles in, in the sense that, you know, often it's a time, 10 years time span. Um, because that's what it takes for me to become knowledgeable about a certain thing often um, and then I move on um, so I was educated as a as an investigative journalist and uh, started out uh, you know I graduated with a very very fine degree and honors from the school and I could probably have gone on to to go pretty far within journalism but I also sensed the so that's in Denmark we have practice as part of the education and I when I was out in in practice I I felt that I didn't really like the world because it was too fast, it was too shallow, and people were way too opinionated. I'm talking about journalist colleagues. Um, you know, there were a lot of a uh, lot of deadlines, and you have to hurry up, and you know, there's never really enough time to go into the deeper matter of things. And and the work environment is hectic and competitive, and you know, I felt like if I end up spending my life in this environment i would be very very unhappy um but but having attended the school of journalism here in denmark i had learned the craft which was super valuable in all aspects of life because what you basically learn if i have to boil it down is to find information to really dive into uh, complex uh, uh, matters and you know try to figure out how things uh, connect and then you have to make sense of all of that in the middle of it. So you find information, then there's the sense making is what does this mean? Who do I need to talk to? Has this happened anywhere else? Uh, where do I need to go? Or who do I need to talk to to really understand this? And then you have to share the knowledge, either by writing or, you know, it could be a radio or podcast or whatever. Uh, and then you have to make it understandable to people you know, relatable and all that. And that's really a craft. It's a very valuable craft that I, at the point I didn't see it as a craft, but I, I really, really, later on in my life, I really appreciated that I learned how to do that. Um, so, so let me ask you this. 
Um, and I think this is a, this is an important understanding of what it means to be a neo-generalist for those who are watching. You took the the skill set that you were that the that developed for you as an investigative journalist, and you took you left that world and you went into other things, but you took those skills with you. So these were transferable skills. And I think that that's I think that's a, a key understanding about not a not neo generalist, but people in general, that we develop these skills that can be applied in a in a wide variety of ways. So how how does that those skills of of the investigative journalists now um, factor into what you do? Well, if I if I had to, you know, we've in all honesty, I think I've always been very values driven in my life. So there's certain things that I really want to stand up for, and it's not meant in a way that you know. Uh, in a rigid way, but there are certain things that I would uphold, and it's fairness, it's generosity, it's freedom. So I have carried that with me into other domains that I have been involved in. Um, and in particular, the thing of helping people to see the world, you know, that's why you often become a journalist in the first place. So it was a really, really good craft to learn. <laughs> and but it, but my my eagerness to help people see things really drove me into that area. Mm -hmm. And then later on, I, I switched gears and I, I started my own company. So I've been an independent for more than 20 years. Um, and I started doing communications for, for especially for companies who did leadership development, uh, business schools and stuff uh, and, and consultancies. And, and I spent nearly 12 years doing that. Uh, and that brought me into leadership because I had to attend all the MBA classes and talk to professors and 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 basically carve out what does it mean? What are the basic elements of this leadership theory, for instance, or what are, what are the challenges that people talk about when they lead a company? And for me, that was a super helpful education on the side, you could say, that really got me into the leadership and management uh, domain. Um, because I had to apply the same skills. I had to figure out what was going on. I had to make sense of it and I had to share with people so they understood what it meant. Um, and then in recent years, the last uh, eight years or so, 10 years I've been working in leadership development because I got really discouraged on the back of the financial crisis of how these companies were educating leaders. Uh, and then, you know, in a moment of self grandiose thinking, I thought I can do this better. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was also hard because when you shift from one domain to the other, you might not have this, the network needed to get work. You might not be in some cases employed by a company because they can't see what, what you can bring to the table if you come from a different um, field. Mm -hmm. There's something here about being recognized as a human being and not just as someone who is uh, only associated with one area for instance does that make sense it does make it does make sense and i i think it it means that we are far more um, capable to do things than we have been led to believe or how and and how we have been educated to understand ourselves and that's you know, when I began to create the circle of impact, the I recognized that the starting point of leadership is is personal initiative. And for personal initiative to begin, you have to have some kind of value system in place. You have to be able to see things. You have to be able to have a desire to change things or to want things to be different. Or and so you're you're uh, taking yourself and you're injecting it into the world. And instead of standing apart and looking at it and critiquing it and making pronouncements, we walk into the world and we become a part of it. And I think that's that uh, encourages kind of this, this specialization of being a neo generalist to occur. I mean, we, you know, the specialization becomes something that 
follows from our our sense of meaning and our sense of values and a uh, sense of purpose for impact. I want to I want to change this. I want to impact these people because I care about these people. And uh, I don't know about all these other people, but these people, I really, they really matter to me. I want to help them. And so I think that's, that's the sort of thing you're, you're saying. I know we, I know we agree about a lot of this stuff. So it's, it's not Mm -hmm. like we're, this is not um, pro and con at all. It's really a coming together of two people who um, kind of believe the same thing, but have had very different lives and have experienced very different lives. So we're, so let me yeah. let's let's take it to a uh, take it to a contemporary situation we're now. We are in um in my estimation here I turned 70 this June. Um in the greatest period of crisis in my lifetime. It's greater than Vietnam. It's greater than Watergate. It's greater than uh it's greater than the two Iraqi wars. It's greater than Afghanistan. It's 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 a kind of a collapse, I use that word intentionally, of all the institutional structures and their credibility and their authenticity. And so to me, that means that the future is going to be very different than what it is, what the present is. Mm. So let's talk, let's talk about what the future what the, you see the future being, um, both, and I see it as hard, but ultimately hopeful. But how do you how do you see the future? And really what is what do you think we should as individuals be doing to um, lead or prepare to be leaders or prepare to make a difference in the future? Mm. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very big question. And I think, um, and, you know, in, in many ways, the question is also, you know, are there any universal things that we should be aware of? considering mm-hmm. yeah a lot of contextual things so things look slightly different in in the u.s where you are even in the state where you are compared to the rest of the u.s right. and then compared to denmark right so so i am always hesitant about sort of you know and i know that that's not what you're asking for but i but i would just want to bring this into the conversation as well that i'm very discouraged about the um what I see in the world as being a reductionistic approach to 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 ap- approaching problems that we see around us, uh, a certain superficiality in the way that we think, a uh, lazy thinking, uh, power structures that work against each other. Um, having said that, you know I think it's important to recognize that we cannot find ways in the future without looking at the past because we are historically situated. So what's going on, for instance, in Ukraine right now has a long history of buildup going back uh, many, even thousand years, maybe, uh, or close to it. Um, but then you had the uh, the, um, the rebelling in the Maidan Square, you had the, the, the annexation of, of Crimea, you know, Things doesn't ju- doesn't just happen out of the blue. They're always sort of situated things within stuff here. And and I um, I think what we need to do is you know I I I did a diving uh, class in in Australia at one point in my life, and I we, the first thing we learned there: if you get into trouble, you should stop, you should breathe, that you think, and then you should act. Oh, and. Yeah. And the pace we have currently with wanting to do stuff, one the busyness of our lives, I think that's a, that's contaminating everything else. Um, and I'm I'm really puzzled about that because we just had a lesson in from if in most cases with the pandemic of the joy of actually doing nothing, the fear the the fear of missing out is not that bad actually. Um, uh, so I'm. I I see that everywhere people are stressed out uh, with the leaders I work with. That they are, um, you know, busy running around, getting nowhere fast. Um, and as a cause of that, they make all sorts of mistakes that then they, they have to correct later on. So there's a lot of what what many people do at the, at, the, at this point of view, where I think that a lot of it's actually so to work. 
Um, it's. Uh, I I also sense that there is a. Uh, I have also lived long enough to remember people who really cared about stuff, you know, who were not just um, in the corporate game. I will be here two years and then I'll, I'll, I'll shift position. I'll go to a new company. I'll do the same thing over, get a higher paycheck and all that. You know, there was some, there was a, an element of loyalty. Uh, in some cases, it was also quite bad uh, because you, then you had, you know, rigid thinking coming into the, into the whole thing. But there's something about that we keep our positions open. So, you know, I know you're a big fan of uh, Sigmund Bauman, the sociologist. And, you know, he talks about liquid modernity. This whole thing of we're shifting our positions constantly. If I don't like the person I'm with, I'll just get a divorce. If I don't like the job I have, then I'll just change it. You know, it's we never really keep things. We, we, we are always in a constant um, pursuit uh, but what are we pursuing? What is it really that we are longing for? And where do we belong in such a world where everything is up for grabs? And I sense that that's sort of an almost like a collective stress that's that's uh, circling around in society right now, that we are looking, we're searching for something, some sort of meaning. And then in the corporate world, they have discovered that they should call it purpose. And, and you know, I've I've investigated that for 10 years. I've written about it extensively. And there's a lot of bullshit around purpose, to be honest. Uh, and again, it's the reductionistic approach to it. It's the simplified version. It's like, oh, yeah, if you can just get that, then you can get people to work harder so we can make more money. And that's not the real purpose of a purpose. Right. Uh, you And I'm, I'm very, very... Uh, concerned about how the business world grabs these terms and then I would almost say that they prostitute them in the service of uh, doing the same thing they've always done, namely only being focused on shareholder returns. Those are, those are that's, those are strong statements and I think there are a lot of people who share those um, and you know the challenge is to um, is to figure out so how do we how do we create a conversation about that where we can actually talk about that and begin to um, break down some of the the hard uh, shell um, obstinance that comes with that you know that we're just going to stay the same because any any um, any accommodation actually weakens us you know when accommodation is a way we actually work with one another but it it needs to be based upon respect and out of that respect comes the uh, the kinds of trust that is needed for collaboration and accommodation and and being yeah. able to solve these kinds of problems i think those are the sort of things that i mean we've talked about this before and so it's not these are not new to you and me um but it is it is new to a lot of people and and so um I, I mean, you know, the fact that they're they're in the fact that they're now saying things to me gives me encouragement that okay, maybe maybe we have turned a corner, or maybe using your room your your house um, metaphor, maybe there's a door in the room I'm in that is now cracked open, and I can look through and see oh there's something there's something in there that I want. So I open the door, I say, I'm going to go embrace that. I walk through the door and I shut the door behind me. So that thing from the past is there and I'm into something new. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's, yeah, it, that's a way of approaching it. But, but uh, you, you know, when you talk about how do we get to, you know, sometimes it's uh, it's hard to say, how do we get people to see what I see? <laughs> Why can't they see what I see? And, and, you know, I think I've learned that the hard way, that you can't really, can't really change someone's mindset unless they have experiences with, with the actual thing in front of them. Um, yeah. and, and that's why I'm also a very big believer in, in practice first, before theories and, uh, um, practical wisdom. So take an example, and, and you know, this might be a good example. In, in Ukraine, 
I, I strongly have a sense that the reason why they're resisting so well and the reason why they're so capable of learning about using uh, new weapon systems and all that is because they are a society of farmers. Mm-hmm. They have practical wisdom. They right. don't have necessarily the uh, academic wisdom, all of them at least, but it's a country of many, many farmers and they have the, the wisdom of the hands, right? They have practical experience of 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 dealing with uh, motorized uh, vehicles with uh, with guns and you know they they work it out yeah with that comes a certain ingenuity that uh, would be harder to you know if it was in denmark we are, we're basically a country of administrators here you know intellectuals we would have a very hard time with you know transitioning into so what do we do uh if that was if that happened to us and i think there's something to that 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 relates to the neo journalists as well there's something about life experiences that what we're talking about here is not just formal education it's uh, i i often talk about it as three-dimensional learning as you know life deep learning learning about your values about what's meaningful to you in life uh, having conversations that sort of uh, put into place uh, in your own mind. What's my place in this world? What do I want to do? But then there's also life-wide learning, learning from elders, learning from being a scout in your youth, uh, playing football, uh, engaging in all sorts of social activities uh, outside formal education. And then you have lifelong learning. So lifelong learning it's sort of a given, right? We learn throughout life. So lifelong, life-wide, and life-deep learning needs to go together, I think. And it's way more than just focusing on having an academic career or, you know, going to a, 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 a fancy university or a business school. Life is like that. So let me, let me ask you, um, as we kind of come to a conclusion here, about um, what your your current work is. What are you doing now? And because um, I'm I'm interested. I, I want. Let me back up and say it this way. What what you've just said is the validation of why I'm doing the, these podcast interviews. Because I want other people to hear other people, listen to people, and tell their story and tell what they think so that we can develop that capacity of talking to one another and not simply waiting to speak, but to listen and to do that sort of thing. So, um, what, so what are you up to now? And, and, um, I know, I know you have a very big project you're doing and it sounds fascinating. I'd like for everyone to hear about that. First of all, I just want to thank you for being, and I'll use the first term that I, I, I used when we started a knowledge broker. Because that's in essence what you're doing. You're 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 bringing people in to have a conversation, to negotiate meaning, and basically, you know, put it out there. And 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 I really appreciate you doing that. And it's a um, it's an honourable task, I think, uh, especially in the times that we live in. So, first of all, thank you for that, Ed. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> so where am I at the moment? I I got a call out of the blue not well about two years ago from a um, quite a famous uh, philosopher we have here in Denmark his name is Ole Fo Kierkeby and uh, and Ole is in my opinion one of the best philosophers we had in Denmark uh, since uh, Søren Kierkegaard the father of existentialism um, and uh, Ole is a very very gentle, kind, quirky person. He is someone who's really dived into the meaning of events in our lives. So he is up there in the international league with uh, Malu Ponty from, from France, for instance, or Deleuze. Um, but he's also someone who's worked at Copenhagen Business School, focusing on leadership, uh, and was really one of the first people in Denmark to talk about the difference between leadership and management, for instance. Uh, before that was fashionable. He is someone who dived into our intellectual or into uh, artificial intelligence as the first one who wrote about it, more or less, here in Denmark. 
And from that, he got into the being interested in the significance of language because artificial intelligence is also about language. Right. So, you know, he's someone that, uh, and he's, by the way, he's also in the book, the neo journalist. He's not, his story is not covered, but we mention him in the book. That's how I met him. So, the book here, uh, I got to go down five minutes down the road and I met Ole. Uh, and then, Seven years later, he, or five years, six years later, he calls me up and asks, do you want to write a biography about me? Because I've been asked by a publisher whether uh, I'd be interested in that. So, so that's been ongoing now for, for two years. Uh, and it's been one of those transitions for me because I had, in order to write this book, I had to learn about philosophy about the interconnectionness between the the history of ideas and uh, the deeper meaning of uh, various uh, topics within philosophy in order to really uh, write this book. So I had to go into the find the information part. Now I'm doing all the sense making. And then in, in a very short time, I'll be doing all the writing. And based on that, you know, I had a more than 150 conversations with, with all about the bigger themes in life about uh, friendship, love, all those uh, death, uh, in order to be able to write that book and then synthesize it so that his life story is almost like this small river that runs in a countryside, but then suddenly it opens up and then it runs into the big ocean, which are all these existential themes. So I'm using concrete life examples from his life to set up larger existential themes and then explain. So what does that mean for you and I? What does it mean for society? What should we be careful about? What should we be enjoying? What should we be care or uh, fighting for even? Uh, so those are sort of, a, that's, that's a big project, but I also see it as a continuation of the new journalist in a way, because Uli is also, uh, what I would characterize as a new journalist is, uh, but he has this sort of overarching language in terms of philosophy that I've also find very enjoyable to dive into because then I'm not tied to one specific knowledge domain because the language of philosophy spreads across all those different domains. Right, right. It's almost for me been like coming home, like yeah, man, there's something in here. There's something super inter interesting that I need to learn about. There's something I need to pay attention to because it can widen my understanding of the of the world uh, and uh, and also elevate the conversations I engage in. Um, hopefully, also make me more uh, less afraid of dying one day or being becoming better at being in a relationship or being a better friend. Um, and yeah, so that's uh, that's the project. <laughs> you know, Kenneth, um, it just it strikes me that um, um, you're you're thoroughly Danish, and you are in in many respects the embodiment of Soren Kierkegaard. I, it's almost um, it, it it's almost as if I'm listening to to Kierkegaard because. Mm -hmm. That same sense of um, quiet, thoughtful um, approach to life, uh, you know, Kierkegaard had an effect upon me when I was in college fifty years ago. So, um, and you know, the that little that little uh, section of uh, either or just resonated with me, but way back then, as if okay, there are these options. There are these. It's oh, there's openness. There's either this or there's that, and and um, I think you're you're providing that kind of picture to us through the the neo generalist idea, but also through these probably the work that you're doing with this the Danish philosopher. So um, just thank you for the work you're doing and and uh, the value it will bring to the world. Thank you, Ed. I I I, I resist being compared to Kierkegaard. I, let me just well, say that as you should, as you should, but it doesn't mean that we can't say, "Oh, well, he he is following it in, in Kierkegaard's steps of being a thoughtful uh, yeah. citizen of, of Denmark, but also of the world." So that's that's really what I'm saying. So, yeah, can I just finally here before we end, can I can I ask you a question? 
Sure. Because I, I'm really curious to know also how the how the neo journalist idea has impacted your life and how it's what it's uh, you know what what you're thinking about it and how it's maybe it's sort of a broadly different perspective into your life. Um. Well, the first thing it did was affirm who I was or, already was. When mm -hmm. when I learned that of this idea, um, it affirmed who I was. And when I was in college, I remember my freshman, first year, first semester freshman year, I was in a history class, a U.S. history class. I was in a, um, a religion class. Uh, I forget the other classes I was in, but I was thinking, God, this is all so narrow. I, how can I? I, how can I how can I spend four years in this little narrow scope of of learning? I, I couldn't do that. And and so I ended up and I wasn't a very good student those first two years. I ended up as an American studies major because I could decide what I wanted to study. And uh, and so this this kind of expansive sense of who I was was present then. And um, and it's that need of curiosity. And when I hear something, um, I'd hear something and I would say, oh, what is that? I'd, I'd go find a book or something or a reference somewhere um, that would explain that to me. I mean, most of these books, I, I, I just fell into it. I heard something. So I'll go on Amazon. And I'd say, oh, uh, you know, I, I mentioned to you uh, before we went on the on about uh, Hartmut Rosa. A uh, German, a German philosopher, in, who's written about resonance and and uh, acceleration, and um, I forget the. There's another term, and um, and and I saw him as listed as possible other people to read on on Amazon. I said, oh, "Wow, that looks really interesting." So I, I bought three of his books right then and there, without even checking Wiki or anything else. So there's this engagement as a neo generalist with the entire world and with the people of the entire world. And, I, and so I take all these ideas, I take all this culture and I use it to understand people and understand what's going on in the world. And, and so um, and so a dozen years ago, I, I went into a series of, um, went to a series of months, which I call the three losses. My, basically I lost all my clients as a consultant. Some came back, but most of them never did. Uh, my marriage of 30 years ended, and then I had taken on a nonprofit organization, and I ended up being fired from that because the board didn't like the idea that I expected them to give money and to raise money with me. And so I was I was at a point of change, and, and I, I accepted that, stepping through the door into the next room, and everything that's happened since then, that was in 2012 has changed my life. That was 10 years ago, a little over uh, on thir uh, 13 years ago. And, and it, it injected me into the, to a, an entire global context. So I've been to 15 countries in the last decade. I've met you, I've met all these people across Europe, across Asia, across Africa, across India. And I'm, I am um, continuing to, to embrace that context. So I see that for me, being the neo-generalist is to be a global person. But at the same time, my specialization is to talk about local communities, is to focus people on their local community. So oh. that's how this 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 fantastic book has, has come to kind of define the course of my work. And, um, and I now know that I'm at maybe a juncture where, where it's going to go in a new direction. This podcast is that, the stuff that I'm writing about synthesis, that's going to be the next stage of where I'm going. And I don't know where that goes. So I have to remain open to people kind of directing me to go where I need to go. I hope that answers it because um, and I would not say you should, I would not say to anyone that you should go out and do what I've done. No, I would say you go, you go out your front door and you look around and say, what's interesting here and go, go, uh, Go engage and engage with it. Go research it. Go go become a part of it. Go work on it. Go make it better, and and you will step by step. You will find that your life changes for the better, and the world that you're a part of will change for the better. And you can look back 
over the course of your life is a series of milestones of real significance and impact that you have had. Yeah, it's a, um, of course, I, 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 I know your story, but it's, uh, you know, I think you, this is very central, what you're saying, this whole thing of, you know, recognizing that we are human beings and that, you know, we have certain, um, certain things that we can do and engage in throughout life and that we need to be careful about or at least be curious about what that is yeah i mean i'm 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 as one of the things that i'm writing about this book with the danish philosopher is the whole I idea of trying to elevate the idea of um the ancient greek term of eudaimonia which means a flourishing life some people say that it's happiness but it's not Mm, right uh, so this whole thing of what is a flourishing life with what life's give what life gives you what the context uh, provides you um and i think um i think that's important to to recognize that this is really about living the life that you can and what you can become uh right. so there's there is curiosity about that right there's this whole thing of um um and and it doesn't have to be hard in the sense it well it is hard to engage with life but it but it doesn't have to be philosophical in that sense it is just life that's just how life is and i'm i'm you know even despite that we go through hardship in life i um my one my one of my favorite writers are his uh the, the french uh algerian french writer albert camus mm -hmm. But Camille was very uh, instrumental in talking about the atrocities uh, that we committed during, especially Second World War, but also the war France committed in, in Algeria. So he talked about human values. Who do we want to be? Who do we want to become? Right. Where do we go? So he had this very famous talk that he did in New York in 1946, just when at the same time, when Eleanor Roosevelt was working on putting together the Declaration of Human Rights, because never again was the idea, will we commit these atrocities again? So we need to uphold certain values in life in order for this not to happen again. And, you know, I always come back to one thing Camus wrote about hardship in life. He said, um, in the midst of winter, I discovered that within me lay an invincible summer. Mm, I like that. And it is my favorite quote because that's the whole thing of, yes, it can be hard where we are right now in the world. You know, all sorts of, um, I think we all sense a, um, there's a sense of urgency, right? If not for all the geopolitical uh, issues that that's that we're being presented with, but also with the climate crisis, for instance, the biodiversity crisis. Um, so where to start? Um, I'm today. I'm way more of a favor of starting like you, and then I'm coming back to your point in the local communities. Do something. Go out and act. Yeah. There's enough talk and there's enough uh, blah blah in the world. We need to be able to. To stand up for what is good and right and 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 truth and 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 what is in in life, I I and a simple explanation or a simple example of that is we had a have, have a local uh, library here where I live, uh, and they wanted to close that down, uh, the municipality, and they have four different libraries in this area where I live, but it was really an insignificant amount of money they could save. So we stepped up as a local community and we wrote all the politicians, you know, we we had uh, meetings with the politicians in, at the library. And, you know, those are the things when you step up for something you believe in, when you say, this is not going to happen, we need to figure out where we can save those money somewhere else, or, you know, at least ask those questions so that we can make an informed decision. So it doesn't just become about politics or interest or power or whatever it might be. 
And I think that's a civil, civil duty we have to step up when it matters, to really Agreed. not be engaged and and and, uh, uh, and be outraged when it when 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 we need to be, but also do it in a way that it doesn't end up with uh, storming the Congress in our in our countries. But at least stand up on an informed basis. That's what I'm talking about. That you have investigated what this means to you and and you know and then have these higher principles that you that you put in front of it um yes well kenneth i i'm grateful to, for you coming on today it's been a great conversation thank you you all for listening um you know this is the kind of quality of interaction that is possible for you in your life if you're willing to listen and to be curious and follow the rabbit trails and the rabbit holes that exist in every conversation we have. So I'm grateful that you've, you've uh, been with us all the way to the end. It's been a long conversation, but re really worthwhile. So this is what I want to say. Please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, but more than anything, uh, comment, ask a question, engage with us so that we can be a part and you can be a part of this network of, of people talking and thinking about the, the world we're living in. And maybe you have a story to tell us and we can be uh, encouraged by your story. Or maybe you, uh, you have something else to say that is worthwhile. And someone else who's reading your comment will say, oh, well, that, that really makes sense. This is not just a two-way conversation. This is as many people as possible participating in how we talk with one another. And this is the way the future, I think, will be, will be established. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Kenneth, for coming on. And, um, and we will see you uh, again real soon. Bye-bye.